Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I appreciate everybody praying for me last week. I, I feel bad because uh, after the service, I laid there for a while and Courtney came and took my temperature and I had a fever. So I immediately started thinking about all the people that I shook hands with and hugged on that morning service. So who in here got sick last week? Three, four. All right. God spared the rest of you. So apparently the ones that got sick weren't living right, apparently. <laughs> and the rest of you were. Judges chapter 6. You believe the Bible? Amen. This story here is one that we refer to often. It's one that, I don't know, we've, we've made mention of this in our lives, about our lives. And notice there up on the screen, I have in big letters, knowing. Um, the different conferences that I preached this year, that's sort of been the theme that God has given me. Um, is this idea of knowing. As opposed to guessing. Now, vast majority of scientists in this world, Ian, this is up your alley here, they theorize that life on earth is how old? Four billion years. They want us to believe that four billion years ago, in this pool of mush, all of the components necessary to make a cell existed. And something happened, some sort of catalyst changed all of those things from being separate things into one thing. Now, to have a living creature, just the basic one-celled organism. You need a cell wall, something that protects what's on the inside. There needs to be some sort of mechanism for taking in nutrients and then converting those nutrients to energy. In the cell, that's mitochondria. There needs to be some sort of mechanism in that cell to get rid of waste or waste will be toxic it'll be poison to the cell then there needs to be some sort of mechanism in that cell that has all of the instructions of what it just became so that it could take those instructions make a copy of them and then form a duplicate cell that was just like the original cell. Okay? Now, there's much more to most cells than just the four things that I told you. There's much more there. But just those four things. A wall of protection. A means of converting nutrients into energy a means of expelling waste and as some sort of means of making a duplicate of itself. All of those have to be in the cell at that moment and operating or when that cell's life cycle is over with, it dies and then there's no more life anywhere. Did I get that pretty right so far? I'm almost as smart as Ian on this stuff. <laughs> Who believes that those four things were generated instantly out of nothing? Not anybody in this church. Do you see how ridiculous it is to believe that on a planet that had no life on it whatsoever, that one day, 
something happened and one cell, one living cell was generated. And from that one living cell, all of the life that's on this planet right now exists from that one cell four billion years ago. Now, the reason why they say four billion years is because the scientists are aware just how difficult it would be for all of these things to be formed together in one day. How many, tr how many trials and failures would have to take place in order for just nature to get this one cell right? How many mistakes, how many trials and mistakes would have to take place before the cell actually came to life and duplicated itself and formed more cells? Do you understand how ridiculous it is to believe that there is no God? And the idea that there is no God is a belief. It's as much their religion as creation is our religion. And it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in what we believe. And that is, it didn't happen by itself. God made it that way. I mean, let's take three billion sheets of paper and one of those old manual typewriters. Remember those back in the day? And put it out in our church's front yard with a sign that says, in four billion years, these pieces of paper will write a novel all by itself. Okay? Because that's what evolution is. Evolution is the science of not knowing where we came from. They don't know. They don't know the mechanism, the catalyst that started all of that. They don't know how it formed. They don't know if maybe a comet flew by and dropped an egg on the earth from some alien planet. That's an actual real scientific theory, by the way. They don't know that. I know that wasp is menacing everybody, isn't it? doesn't it? Okay. Roy, you have my permission to shoot it. Yeah, <laughs> Alicia's leaving. I think it's easier to believe that God made life. And since I believe that God made life, I don't need four billion years for him to do it. Actually, it's, they say it's four billion years old. So roughly it would have taken 11 billion years to get to that point, right? Yeah. Okay. So roughly they say the universe is 13 billion years old and that the first cell formed 2 billion years ago because 4 billion years ago Okay, so it would have taken, what, 9 billion years from the, from the start of the universe, 9 billion years to make that first cell. To be honest with you, I don't think that's enough time. It's not. It is not enough time. If somebody was working in a lab and deliberately not knowing what to do and how to do it, it would be like if, who can I pick on? Michaela. If Michaela, who doesn't know anything about how to build a cell and make it work, if she was granted the gift of living as long as it takes to make that first cell, not knowing anything about how to make it, it would take her 11 billion years, they say, to do it. There's, it's not enough time. And what I'm saying by all that is this. I think it's better knowing where we came from and then knowing who we came from. Because if you'll know where you came from, and if you know who you came from, 
then you might find out where you're going. Does that make sense? And I think down deep in people's hearts, they don't want to know where they're going or they want to forget about where they're going. So they invented this theory about where we came from. And it doesn't work. There's nothing about it that's realistic, nothing about it that works. I would rather know where I'm going than to guess where I'm going. Amen? So I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask you folks on the camera, and you folks in Kenya, I'm going to ask you the question, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know beyond any doubt what your future holds in store? Because we have a book that Peter called a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that take, you take heed as unto a light that's shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. So do you know from this book where you came from and where you're going? That's two questions we're going to ask you. Number two, have you ever had difficulty in discerning God's will for your life? So I'm going to just throw some, some questions out to you. You don't have to answer them out loud. But I just want you to think about. Did you ask God years ago who you should marry? Did you ask God at any time whether or not you should take a certain job or not? Did you ask God where he wants you to go to church? Did you ask God for a miracle so that somebody you know would not die and that they would continue to live? And the, the biggest question here is, have you ever asked God to show you what He wants you to do with your life? Have you ever asked God those things? Have you ever had trouble knowing what God wanted out of you? I have. And I think, I guess, every honest Christian would admit that there were times in life when they did not know what God wanted them to do. Does that sound reasonable? Okay? Because sometimes we ask God and sometimes we don't. When we don't ask God what His will is for us, maybe it's because we just forget about it or maybe it's because we don't want to know what God wants because we know what we already want. And we'd rather not God get involved in it. I don't want God telling me no because I know what I want. And I'm going to do what I want anyway. I don't want to know what God says. And I'm going to be honest with you. There could be people sitting right here today who at a very important crucial time in their life refused to ask God what he thought about it. Because you already had your mind made up what you were going to do. Consider the prodigal son. Did he not already know what he wanted? He wanted his father, he wanted his share of the inheritance. He didn't want to wait for dad to die. I want my share of the inheritance right now. He did not go in and ask his dad, Dad, do you think it's wise that I take my inheritance and going about my life. He didn't ask his father that. He didn't ask him that because he didn't want the answer that he knew he would get from his father. Son, I don't think it's a wise idea that you take all that at your age. I don't think it's a good idea that you take all that right now. I, think that's a, I don't think that's a very smart decision you're making. And in that sense, probably all of us have been guilty at one time or another of wanting something in our life 
And we knew better than to ask God about it because we didn't want to hear the answer that God was going to give us. That's called rebellion. That's what it's called. So Judges chapter 6. This is about knowing. Knowing. What God would have you to do. Judges chapter 6. Are you there? Say amen. Verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. Now we know what happened in the, in the next verse. And it was so. For he rose up early in the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. In other words, he woke up the next morning, all the ground was dry. But that fleece that he laid out was full of water. I mean, he wrung it out and he got a bowl full of water out of that thing. That's a lot of dew in one night. Did he stop there? Because that's what he said, right? He said, I want to know if you're going to send me out. And so I'm going to lay a fleece out. And if the fleece is wet and the ground is dry, then I'll know that that's what you want. So he got, the very next day, he got the answer that he asked God for. But did he stop? Was he satisfied? Why? Why was he not satisfied with that one thing that he asked God to show him. Why was he not finished? Why did he want more? What? What? He didn't like the answer? Maybe? Are you reading my notes? I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Verse 39. And Gideon said unto God, let not thine anger be hot against me. And I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece. And upon all the ground, let there be dew. Did God get angry? No. Remember Gideon. From what we found out so far about Gideon, Gideon struggles with the idea that God's going to use him. He's already told God, God, I, my family is the poorest family of all your people and I am the very least of my brethren. Surely, God, you have somebody greater in mind. You remember when Samuel was told by God to go to Jesse to look for the next king. And he says to Jesse, show me, show me your son. Show me, bring out all your boys and show them to me. So he brings out all of his boys and Samuel's looking at one, the oldest son. And boy, I mean, he's, he's big, tall, strong, good looking young man. And Samuel's going, I bet that's the guy right there. And God says, Samuel, you're looking in the wrong place. Because what I want out of the next king is not going to be how he looks here. It's going to be how he is here. Because David ended up being a man after God's own heart. And he said, Samuel, you're looking on the outside, but I, I want to show you on the inside. And so he looks at all those boys and he says, Jesse, I don't see him here. Is there another? Son? He said, yeah, he's my youngest, but he's out tending the flock. Surely you don't want him. And, and Samuel said, bring him. And when David presented himself, God said, that's the man right there. That's the one I want. Usually, if you're wanting to know God's will for your life, the last place in the world for you to take advice from is the world. Verse 40, and God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. God did not get angry at Gideon. God didn't get tired of him. God made Gideon the way he was. He made his family poor, and he made Gideon the least of all of his family. And God said, 
That's the one that I can work with. That's the one that I'm going to use. And all throughout this chapter, we see Gideon. Here's the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, wait just a minute. I'm going to go get my presence. And when I come back, I'm going to see whether or not I'm talking to God or not. And you remember that story. He brings in a bowl of broth. He brings in meat. He brings in all this bread. And he gives it to the angel. And the angel just makes it disappear. And it's gone. And Gideon said, that's the God right there. I know that I've got the right God. And God, listen to this. When God chose Gideon, God knew that he had the right man to lead his people. Because Gideon is always concerned about what God thinks about my decisions. I want to know what God says about it. I want to know what God thinks about it. I want God to lead. I don't want to, I don't want to hear from anybody else. I want God. You'd be surprised. At the number of Christians who care absolutely nothing about what God wants for their life. The fact of it is, the less God is involved in their life, the better they like it. You got church people all over the world who, they don't mind having a little God on Sunday morning. But the rest of the week in their mind belongs to them. And they're not about to do what some preacher tells them to do. And they're not about to do what some Bible tells them what to do. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And then believe in their heart that they're really saved and really right with God. And I don't think so. If you're a child of God, raise your hand if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, that means God is your father. That means God is your Lord. And it's God's way or no way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, help me preach this message. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would preach it better than I do. Lord, these people, Lord, they're on a long journey of life. And they're just like me. That they, they need to know, God, what you want them to do. God, it doesn't bother them, Lord, on what you want them to do. They just, they just need to know it. God, you created us weak. You created us, Lord, to where we can't even see five seconds into the future, much less five years. And yet, Father, you see everything. You see everything that's coming our way. You have a will for our life and you have a plan for our life. And Father, I've found my happiest times is when I seek you out and find out what you want me to do. And my worst times are when I get this attitude that I don't care what God wants. I don't care what God says. God, I hate that about me. I hate it. And Father, my life does not belong to me. It belongs to you. And so, Lord, when it comes to what you want me to do, Father, I want it to be you who tells me what to do and not me making my own decisions because, God, I'm not good at it. And I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot of terrible mistakes because I didn't listen to you. And I still pay for it to this very day. So Father, teach us how to know your will. Teach us how to know that you're calling us or that you're leading us or that you're guiding us. Tell, Father, we want to know what you have to say about it. Father, bless us like Gideon so that we'll know. Bless and honor your word. Help me preach, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Ian, what Ian was trying to quote to you all ago when I said, why did, why did Gideon want this done a second time? There on the screen, Job chapter 33, verse 14, the Bible says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. To me, what's amazing about this verse is, is that God will say something to man, and then he'll repeat it, and then man's like, he doesn't even grasp it, doesn't even get it. Um, if I, you know, when you work for somebody... 
And it's their business. They're the manager or they're the owner. And it's their business. It's better for you as the worker to know 100% what the boss wants. It's better than either guessing what the boss wants or not being real sure of what he said and then going about doing whatever you wanted to do or whatever you thought he wanted to do. It's better to call him back and say, now boss, I just, I know you probably get tired of me, but I just want to make sure that I'm going to end up doing the right thing. Do you want me to do this and this this way? And if the boss says yes, thank you boss, we'll, we'll consider it done. And if the boss says no, then you say, you know what, I'm glad I called you. Because if I hadn't called you, you would have just lost about $50,000 today on me. So it's, it's better. Hey, husbands, it's better to ask your wife twice what she said and what she wants. Rather than to just guess. Am I telling the truth? But here's, here's your Bible. God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Psalm 62, 11. God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongs unto God. You see, if God's going to say something, watch this now. Gideon, Gideon was establishing the doctrine of knowing God's will. In his example, Gideon was only doing what God wanted him to do to begin with. I will lay a fleece out. God, you give this sign by this fleece, then I'll know. So it happens exactly that way. But Gideon knows something from the Bible, even though it had not even been written yet. Gideon knows that it's best to test the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. Because the devil knows how to quote scripture in just the right way to make you think this is how God is. See, he did that when he tempted Jesus to go take a flying leap. Remember that? He's quoting parts of scripture. And I'm just telling you, the devil wants you to make a lot of mistakes. He does not. He wants you to think that you know God's will. And then not do God's will. Because you didn't know what God wanted. And here is, here is Gideon. Knowing that he needs to test that spirit. So I mean he doesn't just say. I'm going to look for the exact same sign the next day. He reverses it. Today it's. The, the wool is wet, the ground is dry. But tomorrow, the wool is dry and the ground is wet. So he jumbled it up a little bit. But he's not making a move until he knows what God wants him to do. I'd say that's good advice. So what are you talking about? I mentioned some things a while ago. Did you ask God on who he wants you to marry? Did you ask God that? Did you get confirmation? Did you ask God about what job he wants you to take? Because let me tell you something. I've known this for years. The devil will give you a job. And it may sound, well, they're going to pay you good. They're going to give you lots of benefits. And you're going to be gone every Sunday and every Wednesday. Am I right? Did you ask God about the job that you had? Did you ask God about what doctor you should go see? That one doctor says this. Well, you've, you're, you've got cancer. Who was it? Somebody called me here a while back. Say, huh? Yeah, may, yeah, it was Rhonda. Who, her, doc, her first doctor said, you got cancer. You need to start the treatments immediately. Something about it didn't sit right. So she went to another doctor and the doctor ran all the tests and he said, you ain't got cancer. Can doctors be wrong? Can politicians be wrong? Can preachers be wrong? Well, your amen's getting louder for some reason. Hey, what do I always tell you? If you hear me say it and you're not sure, then you go to the Bible and back it up. Because if I'm wrong, I'm going to be wrong here. And if I'm right, I'm going to be right here. And this is it right here. 
So God speaketh once, yea, twice. So here's what I always tell people. Here is God speaketh once, the Old Testament. Here is God speaketh twice, the New Testament. And let me tell you something, and you're not going to, there's a, I'm not even going to get into who doesn't agree with this. But I'm going to tell you something. If God says it once, he'll say it twice in this book. If you're going to believe a doctrine from the Bible, then it had better come out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, 6, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. I mean, don't you think that's a good law to have? I mean, we're going to send a man to the executioner. We better make sure that he's the one that committed the crime. You know, there's a lot of talk, you know, about these sleazy lawyers who get these criminals off. Let me tell you about how our system works. We do not want all of the power to be in the hands of the government. The prosecutorial powers that lies in every county in this country, we do not want the prosecutor to be the only one who decides who's guilty and who's not. Why did law enforcement agencies all over the country start using fingerprints for evidence? Because a defense lawyer made them do it. Why is it that now law, uh, uh, prosecutors now use DNA evidence to prove who was there and who wasn't? Because a defense lawyer made them do it. A defense lawyer said, my client's innocent. Oh, but we've got him at the scene of the crime. Oh, we've got witnesses that say they saw somebody that looks just like him coming out of that house. Oh, yeah? Well, I've got my client's DNA, and I bet you that your samples do not match my client. There's guys that have been in prison for rape for years, only to find out that they did a DNA test, and they're not guilty. Because DNA doesn't lie. DNA is this book. And it doesn't lie. It was defense lawyers who got that going. They're there to make sure the government does its job of proving that somebody did a crime. And I'd rather have it that way than the opposite way. I still don't like some lawyers, okay? But this Bible's right. If we're going to send a man to the death, I'd rather know beyond any doubt whatsoever that he's guilty. And if I've got a question in my mind, I don't want him to be sentenced to death. If we don't know for sure, I don't care, I don't care if you don't like that person. I don't care if you hate that person. I don't care if you think they've done it before. If it cannot be proven that they did this, they're not to be found guilty. That's, that's the Bible. Deuteronomy 19, 15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. When we go stand before God, you know who's going to come and witness at our trial? Our conscience. Our conscience is going to testify at your trial before God. Conscience, was you there? Yes, I was. Did he do it? He not only did it, but I have been bothering him this whole time about it. Look at his face. You can tell he's guilty. That's what conscience will say. Con conscience knows what you did. Hey, young people, children, listen to me. Your mom and daddy know when you're lying. Don't they? Right, Brian? You know why? Because their conscience is right here in their face. Jackson, did you do that? Uh, no. No. Look me in the eye, son. Did you do it? No. Your mom and daddy knows. One witness shall not rise up against any man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. 2 Corinthians 13, 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And I've seen people come up with some goofy doctrines in the Bible. 
Oh, God is like this, or God is like that. Really? Show me two verses that say that. If you can show me two verses. Boy, I better not say this. I'm still waiting for people to show me the verse, the two verses in the Bible that say the world's flat. It ain't there, amen? 1 Timothy 5, 19, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Can I address something? I love you. But I'm going to address something that I know has been a part of this church since I was a child. That people are guilty of. And that is gossip. You know what gossip is? It's prosecuting, judging, and executing sentence against somebody based upon what somebody else told you they did. It's been in this church ever since I've been in this church. And probably was here before I started coming. Gossip destroys a man. Worse than even his own deeds. And I want you to look at that verse, 1 Timothy 5.19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Let's say that Somebody in this church didn't like Brother Sterling. He's an elder. And so, somebody came to you and said, you know, I, I, I probably should not say anything. That's your first clue, that you shouldn't say anything. But I could have swore I saw Sterling at Walmart, and in his cart was a big jug of whiskey. Somebody might actually believe that. And what's happened is, somebody has just destroyed, they've held a trial and found him guilty and executed sentence upon him because somebody said something that they thought might have happened and they presented it as truth. And now all of a sudden, it's not, see, it's not going to stop there, is it? Because whoever that's told to, they're going to go to somebody else. Yeah, well, I know something about Brother Sterling. He likes to hit the sauce pretty hard. Him and his wife both. Huh? Yeah, the fish is getting bigger and bigger. And the deer is getting more antlers. Am I right? If anybody had an accusation against Brother Sterling, it should be done in his presence with at least two people who saw it. Not two people who heard the rumor. Two people who saw it. But that's not what happens. People gossip. They gossip about other people in the church. They gossip to other people in the church. They gossip about me. It ain't right. It ain't right. Because that is destroying somebody's reputation at the mouth of only one witness so there's a there's a whole process in the bible for taking care of things like that so let's say that it was i don't know whoever thought they saw sterling coming out of walmart with a big jug of whiskey in his shopping bag what's the first thing they're supposed to do go to sterling alone with what intention To restore him. 
to restore him. Out of love. Maybe he did. Maybe he was coming out of Walmart with a jug of whiskey. Maybe he didn't trust doctors and pharmacies and he was going to make his wife a hot toddy to get over the pneumonia she had. People still do it. Ain't, ain't, probably ain't the wisest thing in the world, but people still do it. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to sit down with him and find out what exactly happened from him. Now, if he's going to lie about it, I guarantee you God will let you know it. Because then, you go, with a, you go with a second witness. And even at that, now there's only three people in the whole universe... Who knows about this. Still with the object of restoring him. Maybe he did have a jug of whiskey. And maybe it was because. The old flesh kind of was knocking at his door. And God sent some people that loved him and cared about him over to him to say. Hey we just we're praying for you. Is this true? Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I, listen I'm, not, I'm not perfect and I've got my things. And so can we just pray for you about this thing that God, will, that God will forgive you, will forgive you, and it'll be done with. And he'll say, I was hoping somebody would come to me and pray with me because I need help right now. Isn't that better than destroying somebody's reputation? Isn't that better than putting it on stupid Facebook? It's a lot better. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who have you destroyed this week? Or last week? Who have you been gossiping about? Who have you been talking about behind somebody's back? That's not what you're supposed to do. Okay? You may not like them, but God loves them. So, should I preach some more? No, I'm going to hold on to this right here. There's a lot more on this I want to show you, but it's not, I'm not going to be able to get into it. And I think what I just want to leave you with today is what the Bible says about you finding something out about somebody that you go to church with or somebody that you work with. Do you think you could get somebody fired where you work? There's probably somebody there to hate your guts. Just waiting. Just waiting. For you to do something stupid. They're not going to come to you. They're going to run right to the boss. Boss, let me tell you what so-and-so did. Okay? And that's just because they hate your guts. They probably want your job or jealous. Or for whatever reason. And they want you gone. See, that's how the world takes care of problems. That's not how God's people are supposed to do it. You are supposed to love the people that sits in the same church as you. And you're supposed to care about them. And you're supposed to, if you think they did something wrong, and it was serious enough to where you felt something needed to be done, you've got a list of instructions on exactly how it's supposed to be done. Because the God who wrote the rules obviously cares more about this person than you do. So, look at it this way. Brother Sterling, in a moment of weakness, bought a jug of whiskey. That's wrong! You, in a moment of pride, decided to destroy that man. Now who's wrong? You both are. Yeah, but who's done the greater wrong? There is no such thing. 
His sin is his. Your sin is yours. So, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you will admit in front of the church body that it is highly possible that you will commit a sin, let's say between now and the end of the year. Now I'm going to ask you another question. We have two laws given to us by God. One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the second one is which? Love your neighbor as yourself. So, if Brother Sterling saw you with a jug of whiskey, would you want him to tell the whole church first, come running to the preacher, or would you want him to go to you first? Because you would say to him, you're right, I'm sorry. Please don't tell anybody in the church what I did. And that's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I told you a couple weeks ago I got a phone call from somebody. And it's, it's really been troubling me, bothering me what I heard. And it's about somebody you would probably know. And they were begging me, please, please, don't, don't say anything. And I said, I won't, I promise. And you're not going to know it. That's between me and them and the Lord. Okay? And what I counseled this person was... You are in a position to go to that person and talk to them. That's your work. That's your job. And I've been praying that that would happen so that somebody could be restored. If it was my jug of whiskey, I would want to be restored. Wouldn't you? I would. And if you would, so then would the person that you might accuse. They would want restoration as well. Does it make sense? I want you to bow your head. Now, I mean it. I have been in this church since 1974. And a lot of people have come and gone. And if there's one thing that I absolutely know beyond any doubt. Is that there has always been gossip. Going on. Always. Gossip is not love. It's not joy. It's not peace, it's not long-suffering, it's not gentleness, it's not kindness, it's not goodness, it's not faithfulness. The nine fruits of the Spirit, gossiping, is none of those. And what I hate more than anything, you ought to know this about me, what I hate more than anything is a boasting church member, boasting about what they did or didn't do versus what somebody else did or didn't do. I hate that. I don't want a church like that. You don't want a preacher like that. I don't want to be like that. So I'm preaching to Bethel Church. I'm preaching to you people right here, right now. James said the tongue is the most wicked member of our body. And it, set, it can set the whole world on fire. So 
I'm going to ask you to ask God to either convict you about gossiping or rip your tongue out. Because it ain't right. And people have been destroyed because of gossiping. Even if it was true what was being said, they were still destroyed by it. Unjustly. So this morning I'm going to invite you to come down. Or you can stay where you are. But if you've been a gossip, I'm going to ask you to pray. And ask God to forgive you. And by the way, I'm just as guilty as anybody else is. And I have to admit it. So that you don't think I'm just looking down my nose at everybody. But Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what it says. And Father, this word, this Bible that you've given us has the job of corralling our wickedness in so that it's not ever let out. God, I know these people. I love them. I would die for them in a heartbeat. I love them very much. But I know, Father, that this church has always been guilty of the sin of gossip. Male and female, young and old, we've been guilty of it. And Father, I pray on behalf of my church and for my church. God, that you would forgive us you would cause us to repent. We would understand, God, that it's destructive nature. Does not need, that does not need to be here in this church. It only destroys. It never makes anybody better. I pray, Lord, that you would help me. Help my wife, help my children, and all their families. Help us, dear God, and forgive us of the sin of gossip. And Father, for the people in this church, I love them. I thank you for them. I thank God you have blessed us. This is the best church in the world as far as I'm concerned. But we are guilty of the sin of gossip. We're guilty of destroying people's lives and reputations. Even if what we say is true about them. How we said it was wrong. And it should have never happened. Father, will you forgive my people? If you need to chasten us, then so do it. But Father, forgive my people. And help us, God, to put a bridle on our tongue. To keep our tongue from sinning against you and sinning against our brethren. God, help us, Lord, to be a restoration church. A 
church that does not bayonet its wounded, but seeks, Lord, their healing and their forgiveness because we could be the very next person that needs that forgiveness and restoration. Lord, I don't want ever to be taken out of this church. I love it. So, Father, help my conduct be appropriate to keep ministering in this church. Help me to love those who are here by wanting to restore them instead of destroy them. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to remember your word today as we leave this place. We thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. And Father, if, if any of us has gossiped against our neighbor, Father, if it be your will that you would lay it upon our hearts to go to them and ask for forgiveness. Father, that may not be what you want, but Lord, if it is, give us the strength to do it. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said.